Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, president of City Club, and I welcome you all. Those of you uh, here in the Governor Hotel and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio or watching on cable television, thank you for joining us for this week's Friday Forum on this, the 17th of April, 2009. Today we will hear from a panel who will address the timely and provocative question, if newspapers die, can democracy survive? But first I have some announcements. In consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, I ask everyone in the room, if you haven't already done so, to please turn off your cell phones or other devices that may make noise. As always, we are, uh, offer our appreciation to our Friday Forum corporate sponsors without whose generous financial support these time-honored City Club Friday Forum luncheons would not be possible. Our corporate sponsors for this quarter are the law firm of Schwabe, Williamson & Wyatt, Northwest Natural, and Portland General Electric. We thank them all for their support. And if your company or firm would like to sponsor our Friday forums or sponsor our nationally recognized citizen-driven research program, please contact the City Club staff at the back of the room or call the club office. <clears throat> now this week I would also like to welcome the Portland Metro Chapter of the Public Relations Society of America, PRSA. PRSA's Portland Metro Chapter is the largest communications association in the greater Portland, Vancouver metropolitan area. We are very pleased to have its members here with us today. And could all of them, all of the PRSR members who are with us in the room, please stand so we can give you a City Club welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And we want everyone here today, and especially those of you who are not members of the club, who are former members of the club who have let your memberships lapse, to know that we are in the midst of our spring membership drive. Now this is a very important effort, especially this year, as the club is hard at work filling a $35,000 operating budget deficit that we face due to the effects of the economy that all of us are confronting. Membership recruitment is a key part of the club's budget balancing effort, and you all can help. For those of you who are club members, please try to recruit one person from your table who will join today. So you might kind of eye everybody at your table right now. <laughs> and th for those of you who are not members or who are lapsed members, please consider joining today. Uh, if we are successful recruiting just 200 new members uh, during this spring membership drive, we will erase our budget deficit. Now we also have incentives to uh, encourage you to participate in our membership drive. First of all, during the spring drive, we are waiving the $25 one-time membership fee. Second, for each new or lapsed member who is recruited to join by an existing member, both the new member and the recruiting member will receive uh, a voucher for a future Friday form of, of their choice. So as you eye each other, you might think about cutting a deal here. And third, to the person who recruits the most new or lapsed members during this spring drive, City Club will be giving a grand prize of dinner for two at the new Nel Centro restaurant opening up in the Hotel Modera in downtown Portland this spring. So please ask yourself how much City Club being in this community means to you and how much our programming like these Friday forums means to you and help with our membership drive accordingly. Now membership forms are available at the membership table in the back of the room or you can join online or call the club's office. Now as to the club's programming, there remain several uh, club sponsored events in April. <clears throat> this Monday, April 22nd, the club's next installment of our human trafficking series will be held. Next Friday, April 24th, the club will host our monthly final Friday social hour, this time at the Wine Down on 28th Wine Bar. On Saturday, April 25th, the club's new leaders council will host a trail walk and discussion of this region's growing trails network led by Metro Council President David Bragdon and Washington County Commissioner Dick Scouten. And on Wednesday, April 29th, the club's Citizen Read book group will discuss the, the book Beauty of the City, about a biography about famed Portland architect A.E. Doyle with the book's author in attendance. Now books for this uh, meeting are sale from Cynthia at the back of the room uh, and please consider picking up a book for that uh, meeting. 
And next week here at Friday Forum, the Port of Portland's Executive Director, Bill Wyatt, will address his views of Oregon's current economic situation and the outlook for the future, given the importance of trade, manufacturing, and the transportation sectors in which uh, the Port of Portland is heavily involved. That's right here at the Friday Forum next week. And now to today's program. In an article in The Nation magazine earlier this month, commentators John Nichols and Robert McChesney state, and I quote, after years of neglecting signs of trouble, elite opinion makers now recognize that things have gone horribly wrong. Journals ranging from Time, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and The New Republic, to The New York Times and The Los Angeles Times concur. Newspapers are disintegrating and are possibly on the verge of extinction." Close quote. Now what you might ask is the significance of this development. Well, Nichols and McChesney conclude as follows, and again I quote, the crisis involves more than mere economics. Journalism itself is collapsing. With it comes the most serious threat in our lifetimes to self-government and the rule of law as it has been understood in the United States. And I want to repeat that last sentence. With it comes the most serious threat in our lifetimes to self-government and the rule of law as it has been understood in the United States. So say those two commentators. Yet one also hears from others, especially those who are younger and those who obtain their information principally from the so-called new media sources, primarily from the internet, who feel strongly that commentary like that that I just read from the Nation article is the sky is falling view, reflecting the establishment's resistance to social and technological change. Indeed, some new media advocates argue that the current trends really represent the actual democratization of access to information in a more open society. So which is it? Which view is the right one? Or is the truth somewhere in the middle? And how important is the question to begin with? Is democracy indeed really at stake as, as newspapers struggle or fail? Or is democracy actually being enhanced through the new media? And how do we know the answers to these questions as citizens? Indeed, and ironically, who do we read and who do we listen to to try to figure out the answers to these questions? Well, today we are fortunate to have with us a panel of three people with differing but important views on this subject. Our first speaker today is the City Club's own Executive Director, Charity Fain. Prior to joining City Club in June 2008, Charity served as county, uh, Country Director at, uh, in Kyrgyzstan for Internews Network, where she directed a journalism training and uh, television production program. Charity also served as project manager coordinating the Courage in Journalism Awards for the International Women's Media Foundation and was program officer for the National Democratic Institute. Our second panelist is Peter uh, Batia. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I made sure to confirm it, now I screwed it up. Batia. Executive Director of The Oregonian. Peter has served as editor at newspapers large and small, including the Sacramento Bee, uh, the Dallas Times Herald, and the San Francisco Examiner. He joined The Oregonian in 1993. Peter Batia is the past president of the American Society of Newspaper Editors and is on the board of directors of the American Press Institute. Newsroom projects he helped lead have won seven Pulitzer Prizes, including four right here in Portland, and he is a four-time Pulitzer juror. Today's final speaker is Professor Al Stavitsky. I told him he's the only professor I know who goes by the name Al. He's the Senior Associate Dean of the School of Journalism and Communications at the University of Oregon and the Director of the school's George S. Turnbull Center here in Portland. After earning a bachelor's degree in political science at the University of Wisconsin, Al Stavisky worked in radio and television. He later earned a master's degree in journalism and a doctorate in communications from the Ohio State University, and he joined the University of Oregon faculty in 1990. Now our speakers, speakers will speak in the order in which I've introduced them, and each will speak for approximately 10 minutes so that we will have at least 15 minutes for questions and answers before we adjourn at 1.15. Now finally, on a personal level, I have a few quick tidbits of information about each of our panelists and, and in reverse order. Al Stavitsky says he got into journalism as a radio sportscaster in high school in New Jersey when he realized that he would not grow up to play baseball for the New York Mets. 
in major part because he could neither hit nor throw a baseball nor run very well. Uh, also, after moving to the University of Oregon, he was actually named Eugene's Funniest Person after a comedy, co comedy, uh, comedy competition. We'll see about that today. As to Peter Batia, he admits to one uh, story that may have be significance to probably about half of you in the room. Now, when he was an undergrad at Stanford, at a Stanford-Oregon basketball game at Stanford, he actually orchestrated the mugging of the Oregon Duck mascot. <laughs> and the theft, this is to warm up the crowd, Peter. And the theft, the theft of the mascot's duck head. After the duck head was passed up the stands in a human chain, and out of the arena, he actually got it back to his frat house where they took pictures with it, but they did return it to the University of Oregon. Now finally, as to our own Charity Fane, she tells me that she once was served the head of a sheep at a formal dinner with the Minister of Education at Kazakhstan, and was told that because she was the youngest unmarried female at the table, she had to ear, eat the ear of the sheep so that she would learn to listen to her future husband. She, t she also adds that she's now married and it didn't work. <laughs> so please welcome our panel, Al Stavitsky, Peter Batia, and Cherry Fay. We've all seen the headlines. The San Francisco Chronicle is losing a million dollars a week. The New York Times Company threatens to close the Boston Globe. The Rocky Mountain News to close, publish final edition Friday. Across the country, newspapers are closing, going online only, cutting newsroom staff. So I ask you, why should we care? Printed materials are a dying form, right? According to the Pew Research Center, only 27% of people born after 1976 even read newspapers. The internet, email, blogs, Twitter, They've changed how we all receive news and process information. The world of journalism is also changing, and we as a society have to be aware of how that could impact us. Now, I'm not gonna stand here and address whether old media or new media is more important or stronger. I instead would like to talk about the importance of press freedom and a free press, and the journalists who work within that system and what it means for a democratic society. I'm not a journalist. I'm not here advocating for my own profession. However, I am someone who's worked in democracy building for about 15 years. As a part of that work, I've advocated for press freedom as a human rights issue, have managed leadership training programs for US editors, um, and have run a journalism training program in Kyrgyzstan, which is in the former Soviet Union, for those of you who don't know. I've also, I'm also here today, like many of you, as simply a concerned citizen. To paraphrase Thomas Jefferson, to preserve the freedom of the press, every spirit should be ready to devote itself to martyrdom, for our liberty is guarded by the freedom of the press. Now, I'm not advocating that we all run outside and throw ourselves in front of a bus to protect our local paper, but I do think Thomas Jefferson's sentiments reflect the importance that the founders of the United States gave to a free and robust press. It was so important that the right to a free press is protected in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Democracy depends on the ability of citizens to make choices based on quality, credible information. I don't want to debate with you whether we think our system actually works that way or not, but to appeal to our higher aspirations. No one here today can really say with 100% accuracy of what the state of journalism will look like in the next 10 years. We know we're going through a period of transition as old models fail and new ones are emerging. As methods of news di distribution are changing, people in the United States are increasingly bombarded with messages from advertisers, political interest groups, grassroots campaigns, just to name a few. The messages right now are still coming to us via print material, but are increasingly coming into our inboxes via blogs and partisan websites. I ask you to take just a few seconds now and think what would the world look like if we didn't have local news coverage? Not opinion coming from partisan sources, but local news coverage. 
I'd imagine it's probably kind of hard for you to imagine that because most of you have never lived in a society where multiple news outlets staffed by pro professional journalists. Unfortunately, I have lived in such a, a, such a society and I don't have to imagine what that world looks like. As I mentioned before, I've worked in democracy building and free press issues for most, in the former Soviet Union for most of my career. Democracy building internationally basically includes four main areas. Government institution, rule of law, civil society, and a free press. That's right, a free independent press. And I mentioned earlier that I ran a journalism training program in Kyrgyzstan. This is a country that has a very struggling independent press with newspapers, television news, radio. However, the state of journalism in this country is extremely weak due to a couple of factors. One factor, censorship, both state-sponsored and self-censorship. For example, one of the journalists in my office uh, did, produced a television show, a political de debate show called The Angry Pen, where she would interview government officials, political leaders, and it was broadcast on, the, on this national state-run television channel. And if the president himself didn't kind of like something that a speaker would say, he would, his office would call the station manager and our program would be pulled. No idea how he knew what was going to be on there in advance, but we would get no, no story, no background. The story was just pulled. While this kind of blatant censorship was bad, it was nothing compared to the poor quality of professional journalism and the extremely low numbers of professional journalists in most of the country. Because most reporters received little training, they didn't understand just basic principles. I remember sitting in a journalism training class where the trainer would go line by line through a newspaper, pointing out opinion, opinion, opinion. It was almost impossible to find a fact. And this was really common for what was called news reprinting of official pieces from the government or party leaders. Some papers were little more than political propaganda. And there was also the common practice of paying a paper to run whatever story you wanted. And this was actually how most papers made money. It's hard to find, it was hard to find news stories full of facts where a journalist had checked them, reported them without political faction, or just a basic amount of truth. So you were left with rumor, innuendo, and extreme distrust. Just think about the game you might have played as a kid where one person would whisper a secret and it would pass all around the room and that the person on the other end would stand up and, and repeat what that secret was and it was never remotely like the first one. That's exactly what it would be like in Kyrgyzstan on basic news stories. Rumors would fly across the country from family member to family member, from the north to south, via telephone, email, texting. They did have those things. But during mo moments of crisis, it was most acute. When I was living in Kyrgyzstan, it was a time of major political turmoil, and there were protests every fall and spring. In fact, my apartment was directly across from the president's house, which was also called the White House, and I could view all the protests from a kitchen window. Sometimes this would be extremely, would be frightening because all you would hear, you would see riot troops coming out, you'd hear tear gas cannons going off, and you'd see people running out of the square, and you had no idea what was going on. There was no news out there covering it live. You had to wait an hour until the TV stations got back to, and were broadcasting it. You were calling everyone. Nobody had a clue, and I was watching it firsthand out of my kitchen window. Imagine what it was like for the people and back in the rest of the country who, who could find no real source of what was going on. So in Kyrgyzstan, you had on one hand the trappings of formal journalism that was weak and political. And on the other hand, you had informal networks that would spread rumor. This type of system really breeds mistrust and dissent. And without a basic level of trust, you can't build a civil society and democracy cannot exist, and it doesn't there. Sadly, Kyrgyzstan was the freest of all the post-Soviet countries I worked in. The other countries were more restrictive, and that's because a free press is something dictators, drug gangs, criminal regimes the world over fear. 
They expand enormous efforts to control, manipulate, and murder courageous journalists. In fact, the Committee to Protect Journalists reports that in 2008, 41 journalists died because of their work. At least 26 reporters and photographers were kidnapped. Another 125 were in prison cells around the world. And more than 80 journalists fled their country under threat. You might ask yourself, you know, why is she talking about attacks on the press internationally? What does that have to do with us? I want to draw your attention to the links that individuals and governments go to to silence the truth. Ironically, tyrants, perhaps more so than even U.S. citizens, understand the power of a free press, which is why they go to extreme efforts to squelch press freedom. In the United States, we have a system that constitutionally protects the freedom of press. At this moment, it does seem hard to imagine a time where we would have people silenced. Actually, we seem to have more opinions floating around the blogosphere than ever before. However, I think one could argue that a free press is being threatened, but not by attacks, but by an economic system that is causing newsrooms to close and journalists to lose their jobs. This is not like the banking sector and automobile makers. They do provide, those sectors do provide capital and jobs, which are important, but journalism is crucial to keeping our governments in line, corporations on track, and to make sure we have enough information to make solid decisions. Journalists help ensure our fundamental right to a free press. I know it's not always perfect. Jour newspapers make mistakes. But professional journalism is part of the foundation of a functioning democracy, and we should not forget this. So ask yourself, are we in danger of truths not being told? Because there will no longer be journalists on their beats, knocking on doors, questioning, confirming sources. The issue for me personally isn't whether the news comes in print or online. It's will there be enough people left at the end of this transition period to keep covering the stories excuse me, in a professional manner. For example, when the Seattle Post Intelligencer went online only, its newsroom went from about 150 members to 20. Think about that for a second. 150 to 20. So if you do the math on this and assume a conservative 40-hour work week, I know that's not real in a journalism world, with the print version, 6,000 hours a week used to be devoted to putting out a paper. Now you've only got 800 hours. How many stories do you think will go uncovered? Because there just aren't the people there to cover them. This sort of hours cutting is happening in newsrooms all across America. So even if papers are not closing, they're being horribly understaffed. We are losing years of experience, knowledge on local issues, time spent building contacts, and yes, opportunities for good investigative journalism. There are local papers here that need our support, and I believe we need to ensure a variety of local news outlets. Multiple papers, TV news, radio, and yes, quality online news reporting outlets. For me, we need to make sure we keep quality professional journalism at the core of any news media outlet. Distribution mechanisms will change in the coming years. But we can't afford to allow the quality of journalism to worsen. So when you listen to Peter and Al talk, I hope you'll remember my message. Professional journalists are core to ensuring a free press. And a free press is vital to a functioning democracy. People the world over are killed fighting for the right we hold sacred. We can no longer afford to take this right for granted, and journalism and a free press are worth our efforts to preserve them. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Jim. I think, uh, I think. for the wonderful introduction, I, I, I think I should make clear that the duck head was paper mache. We didn't like rip the head <laughs> off a duck. Um, I wouldn't want PETA coming after me. I generally don't talk about that publicly, at least in Oregon. Um, I would just say my only regret is that we never got around to stealing USC's horse. 
I was back at my alma mater two weeks ago for the dedication of a new building for the Stanford Daily, the student newspaper there that I worked on as an undergraduate. The featured speaker that day was Bill Keller, the executive editor of the New York Times. Bill joked in his remarks that dedicating a new newspaper building was roughly akin to a ribbon cutting at a new Pontiac dealership. <laughs> Two days ago, a colleague forwarded an interview with an old friend of mine, a former journalism professor at San Francisco State who's now a businessman. He said pretty directly that newspapers are dead, buried, and about to be gone. There is no hope. It's over. Last week, on occasion of the annual Newspaper Association of America convention in San Diego, a prominent blogger and critic of newspapers wrote this, directed at newspaper publishers. You blew it, he said. You've had 20 years since the start of the web, 15 years since the creation of the commercial browser in Craigslist, a decade since the birth of blogs in Google, to understand the changes in the media economy and the new behaviors of the next generation. Now, he said, it is too late. That isn't a particularly rosy picture if you, like I, value newspapers and the important contribution they make to society. But here's the undercovered part of that story. Nobody, no one really knows if newspapers will go away. No one really knows where technology will lead media and information. No one can predict the future because the technology is moving so quickly and it, not talking heads, will determine the future of newspapers. Before going on about this, I want to make an important distinction. There are newspapers, ink on dead trees, and there is newspaper journalism, the stories that appear in newspapers. I told a group of our summer interns last year that what really matters to me is not that newspapers survive, although newspapers have defined my life, but that the kind of journalism that only a newspaper can provide must survive the deeply reported investigative story, the beautifully told narrative, the columnist who makes you laugh, cry, or throw the paper down in disgust. That's what must survive. And I believe newspaper journalism will survive, perhaps not in print, but I believe our society will demand it and require it. There is an awakening out there about what is at stake as newspapers struggle. If for no other reason, then people want help in sorting out all the noise on the internet. They want information that is verified and not just the opinion of a random blogger with a laptop and a point of view. But back to newspapers in our current plight. My friend who took on publishers is right. Newspaper companies have been slow to fully embrace the internet and we did not fully realize the disruptive threat of Craigslist and other web services that have largely taken away a staple of our traditional revenue at newspapers, that being classified advertising. The gift of hindsight that pundits have today allows them to be very high and mighty. But here's what they don't tell you. 90% of the revenue coming into just about every newspaper company still comes from print, not their web businesses. It's understandable, however wrong it may turn out to be, that we've held on to our tried and true ways of doing things especially given the extraordinary profits that newspapers have provided their owners over the years, often 20 to 30 percent annually. Today, we clearly face a crisis, fueled as much or more by the current economic situation than by the impact of the internet. Revenues are shrinking, and we're stuck with a very expensive method of production and delivery. Not that getting a newspaper delivered to your house for about 15, months, 15 bucks a month every day of the year is such a bad deal. I would also emphasize that our current crisis is not because the public has turned against us because we are carrying forward some socialist or far left agenda. That just isn't the case despite the ramblings of crackpot talk show hosts. And you know who I mean. And, and let me just say, heck, in this town anyway, the left is just as verbal as the right. I've literally been called a commie and a fascist in back-to-back -back phone calls. So it's important to know that our crisis today is caused by a dramatic shift in the way information and news can be distributed and by the destruction of a revenue model that has thrived for more than a century. It, in turn, has been exacerbated exponentially by the dramatic downturn in the economy. But what's done is done, so let's look forward for a bit rather than back. Here's the more important question. How do we save newspapers, or more important, 
newspaper journalism. There are a whole bunch of ideas out there. Some have suggested newspapers should be run by nonprofits. That there are evidently conversations underway in San Francisco to perhaps try to save the San Francisco Chronicle by establishing some sort of nonprofit foundation. A politician back east has proposed tax breaks for newspapers, as long as we don't endorse political candidates. More serious conversation is growing about trying to charge for content that's long been free on the internet or working to charge all the various web aggregators and search engines that capture our content, which is very expensive to produce, and don't pay us a dime for it. And there's a lot of discussion about micropayments, sort of an iTunes model for news, download a story for 99 cents, that sort of thing. To be honest, I'm not sure there's a winner in the bunch. A nonprofit foundation would need billions, that's with a B, to support the operations of a metro daily newspaper. The charging for content model sort of went out the window a long time ago, although many papers are experimenting anew with it. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for example, uh, Miss Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for example, subscribers pay extra to get insider coverage of the Green Bay Packers online. Now, that's Milwaukee and the Packers, and I don't need to explain that to you. But maybe that could work for us in coverage of the Trailblazers. Maybe. But what's to keep somebody from copying that content, bringing it out behind the paywall, from behind the paywall, and, and ruining our exclusive? Nonetheless, serious efforts are underway just in the past couple of weeks to find ways to help newspapers recapture revenues from the web. Will it be enough to recapture what we have lost and return us to the prosperity of the past? No, there's no way. It's just not going to happen. But these and the other efforts that, we're go that are going on will lead us to some hybrid, I believe, that can keep newspapers and newspaper journalism alive for a good long time. What will the surviving newspapers become? My best guess, as of this moment, is that newspapers will get smaller in size and more focused in content. They'll be more local, analytical, in-depth, and full of context. They'll be more low, uh, I just said that. The days of being something for everyone are gone. Instead, I think you will see the further migration of breaking news and information to the web and a greater emphasis in print on what it all means. I personally think it's likely that we'll move away from traditional sectioning and our long established models of staffing by section. Business reporters covering business, sports reporters covering sports, and so on and so forth. We simply aren't gonna have enough people to do that going forward. And the technology will bring us a new, new kinds of devices that go way beyond Kindle and Kindle 2 that mimic the on-paper reading experience and will render sectioning less important. We'll have areas of expertise and depth, not unlike now, but fewer areas and even more depth. And I believe our organizations will fully embrace the digital world and will be much, le much less attached to the factory model that has driven us so long and that will work much more effectively across all the platforms that technology will provide us. The lines between print and TV will continue to blur and will fade away. There'll be more reader contributions, not just pieces submitted for the op-ed pages. And social medias, I mean, heck, even I have a Facebook page, will be a place where we offer news, leverage it, and engage with our communities. As the factory fades, we'll become much more entrepreneurial, creating new products and riffing off that new technology. I'm excited about all that that can offer, even with the uncertainty of the economics. But I believe with all my heart that our society will still need journalists. It will be a much less exclusive title, it already is, but I mean journalists who embrace traditional values, those of fairness, completeness, and truth-telling. Let me take a couple of moments in conclusion to talk about the Oregonian in particular. We certainly have not been immune to the economic tsunami that has hit our community, state, and nation. You probably heard today that Oregon now has the second highest unemployment rate in the country. Like many other companies, we've had to reduce staff and expenses. The economic times show up every day in the paper with fewer ads and the resulting fewer pages. But please, don't confuse the Oregonian with what you have read and heard about other newspapers. We are not the Seattle PI, nor are we the Rocky Mountain News. Again, don't believe the ideologues and the boo birds who have some beef with the paper because they don't like the fact that the honestly gathered news we present doesn't line up with their extreme left or right philosophies. They would have you believe the Oregonian will be the next to die. 
Let me make this simple and clear. The Oregonian is not going away. First, the most troubled papers have been troubled for many years, even decades. The Oregonians had one bad year last year, the first bad year in memory. Now, we don't have the books from when Henry Pittock was running the Oregonian in 1857, but uh, as far as we know, it's the, it's the first bad year we've had. We've taken steps to ensure our profitability going forward, as we must do to be an ongoing business. If we have to do more, we will do more. But as I've said, no one can predict the future and there's no question newspapers face a troubling one, but the Oregonian will very much be a part of Portland's future. Second, it's important to note that we're a debt-free company. We're not like many papers like the Chicago Tribune or the Philadelphia Inquirer, whose owners are burdened with huge debts, the result of heavily leveraged purchases of those companies, and now are in Chapter 11. Third, we're blessed with amazingly supportive owners, the Newhouse family of New York, and amazing internal leadership at the paper, that of Fred and Pat Stickle, Sandy Rowe, and a genuinely gifted and dedicated staff in every aspect of what we do, from the newsroom, to our advertising staff, to the press building over by PGE Park, and the people who ultimately deliver the paper. Fourth, we remain a vital and committed part of this community, both in the work we do journalistically, but also through programs such as our annual season of sharing drive. This year, in the midst of this economy, reader donations through the paper sent almost $400,000 to families, agencies, the food bank, and other important causes. And fifth, and most important to me, we remain committed to honest, truth-telling, outstanding journalism. Yes, we have fewer journalists, and we miss desperately those who've taken voluntary buyouts and left us. But those of us who remain are as committed as ever to being the eyes and ears of Portland and Oregon, and to providing detailed watchdog, enterprising, and investigative journalism that you expect from us. Please consider the impact of some of our recent work. There are seven bills right now moving through the legislature to overhaul how the state regulates teachers. All seven were drafted in response to our award-winning series on teacher misconduct last year. State officials have declared a moratorium on foster children being sent to other countries in response to our recent investigation that described how the Department of Human Services failed to protect a four-year-old girl who was tortured and killed by relatives in Mexico. Hearings are being held today on two bills that will better monitor and protect children in international placements and adoptions. There's also a House bill that will require the state to review the psychiatric drugs administered to children who are in state custody. That followed a November 2007 investigation by Michelle Cole and Brent Wolf. Brent's in the room today that found children in foster care were prescribed powerful medications at four times the rates of their peers. Another House bill is about to be introduced to limit the amount of subsidies the state hands out each year under the Business Energy Tax Credit Program. That follows our investigation in January into the tax giveaways that showed millions of dollars going to risky ventures with questionable environmental benefits and to prosperous companies that admitted they don't need the incentives. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. This is what we're at about at the Oregonian, and we believe it's something worth paying for. But we're not stopping there. Please stay tuned for more analysis of the true cost and the real benefit of the Major League Soccer deal, as you probably saw in this morning's paper. And of course, you can count on us for the inside story of the Trailblazers' return to the playoffs. Please understand, we aren't perfect or as comprehensive as we'd like to be. The times have taken a toll on us like they have on all, all other businesses. But we're here, we will be, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to make that declaration to you today. We have much work to do to get to the new world that I've touched on. In closing, I'll return to that interview with the professor I mentioned earlier. He also said that going forward, newspapers will bear no resemblance to what they are today. And the final analysis, I'm not sure that's such a bad thing given all the opportunities before us. I'm honored to be with you today and to share the dais with Charity and Al. Thank you very much. Well, 
Good afternoon. Uh, usually when I'm speaking in front of a crowd like this, the first thing they want to know is what's going to be on the exam. So let me, let me start there. I will, I'll start by answering the question, uh, why do newspapers matter? The decline of newspapers portends the decline of reporting. Professors always say things twice that are going to be on the exam, so, so you can write it down. So I'll say again, the decline of newspapers portends the decline of uh, reporting. And now, now that I've said that, you go back to checking your, your Facebook pages on your, on your laptops. Uh, by saying this, I mean no disrespect to my colleagues in electronic media, which is where I started in the news business. But I believe that most serious watchdog journalism, the kind that holds those in power accountable, the kind of stories with the impact that Peter just talked about, the information that, that gives us the civic information that we need for, uh, for our democratic system, most of that originates with newspapers. And that's what Peter means, uh, I believe, when he says that's newspaper journalism, even if it's not actually uh, ink on paper. There's a news ecology, much as there's a, a natural uh, ecology. The big fish are the major national news organizations. The journalism they produce runs in national publications and on national broadcasts, and it gets picked up by local newspapers through, say, the New York Times Syndicate or the Associated Press. You mix in uh, coverage of local doings from print and broadcast outlets and uh, alternative media, and then you pretty much have the uh, American news diet. This reporting is then amplified many times over by commentary from the, the punditocracy on talk radio and on, uh, and on cable uh, TV. And now, of course, we have added to the mix the blogosphere, which largely draws upon this vein of news that comes from mainstream media, what we call the, the so-called news agenda. And it's newspapers that set much of this news agenda, which then bubbles down through other media. If you uh, consider uh, comparing what's in the New York Times and the Washington Post uh, in the morning and then what's on uh, CBS News and, uh, and NPR that evening. Similarly, on a regional level, newspapers such as the Oregonian influence what you hear on air or what you read uh, online in markets such as Portland. And even with the recent job losses, metropolitan newspapers still employ far more journalists than to broadcast outlets. They cover far more stories. And while TV and radio journalists do indeed conduct uh, original reporting, much of it quite good, most of the stories that are in play at any given time, what we call the marketplace of information, were put in play by newspapers. Yes, it's true there is a wealth of information available online and many people get their news from sites that are not run by news organizations, but rather Google, Yahoo, or from uh, some of the, the aggregators, such as Dig. That's, uh, that's Dig with two Gs, by the way. And it's, and it's a very interesting case. You should take a look, if you have it, at dig.com. It's a website where the community of users make the editorial decisions. They recommend uh, content that they've seen from elsewhere across the web, and then they link to the, uh, the Dig site. And there's lots and lots of interesting material there. Uh, most of it, shall I say, uh, borrowed uh, from uh, newspapers uh, around the world. And DIG is especially popular with young people, many of whom feel then that they don't have a stake in the decline of, uh, of newspapering. But DIG is a prime example of uh, how, as uh, some media critics put it, online journalism is essentially parasitic. It is largely built upon original reporting that originally uh, appeared in print. So, so hence my argument, if newspapers are in trouble, then the ecosystem is, is out of whack and the quality of our supply of shared civic information is, uh, is endangered. Now there is, of course, the, the counter argument. Uh, Jim reflected that in his, uh, in his uh, preface that Newspapers are sort of the standard bearers of the professional legacy media, and they, they often get it wrong. And uh, the elite papers it's been charged were insufficiently suskept, uh, skeptical of the uh, administration's uh, case for war in Iraq and 
More recently, they were caught unawares as the foundations of the uh, economy uh, began to crumble. And so why not then? This argument goes break the chokehold that, uh, that, that this journalistic priesthood has on, uh, on information. Uh, you may have seen that the founder of one of the most well-known online news sites, uh, Ariana Huffington of the Huffington Post, referred to journalism as a shared enterprise between its producers and its consumers. So if you think about that, journalism as shared enterprise, and um, indeed the digital revolution has given anyone the tools to become a journalist. Uh, you may have seen me uh, tapping away on my iPhone there while, uh, while Charity and Peter were speaking. Uh, I was, was not rudely checking my email, uh, honest, uh, but I was tweeting. I was sending accounts of this forum to, uh, to Twitter. So the story's right out there now before the Oregonian, uh, before any of the broadcast outlets, before you're going to hear it on OPB. That story is out there uh, right now by citizen journalist uh, Stavitsky. Uh, albeit in 140 character uh, snippets, because that's all you're allowed on, uh, on Twitter. But, uh, but the news is out there in, uh, in what's called these days the, the status fear, uh, as the realm of Twitter and Facebook is, uh, is now called, because these platforms ask you to say, what are you doing right now? What's your status? So journalism is no longer a spectator sport. Citizens are becoming actively involved, whether they blog or podcast or share stories on Dig or post videos to YouTube or even work for the small but growing number of uh, citizen journalism uh, sites that are out there. And traditional media are paying attention. They're soliciting uh, content from readers, listeners, and viewers. Peter referred to that. Uh, CNN has gone as far as creating a program called I Report for CNN, which showcases video uh, viewer submissions that are known as I Reports. Closer to home, OPB has uh, innovated uh, with its Public Insight Network, which enlists listeners as sources for stories produced by OPB journalists. They call this new model distributed journalism, or wisdom of the commons journalism, and, and it adds value to the news, no question about it, and clearly legacy news organizations uh, like the Oregonian are going to have to figure out how to leverage and assimilate these citizen contributions. But Citizen-generated content is no substitute for on-the-ground reporting, for the pursuit of facts, for what we call the journalism of verification, as opposed to the journalism of assertion, which dominates talk radio, the blogosphere, and so much public discourse. And citizen selection of content on sites such as Dig is no substitute for the news judgment of professional editors who take seriously their role as watchdogs on the powerful. So clearly we need professional journalism as the foundation of the information society and that's why we need newspapers because the decline of newspapers portends the decline of uh, reporting and that will be on the exam. Um, just to close, let me note that uh, if, if you'd like to, to spend not just lunchtime but an entire day uh, discussing the future of journalism, uh, you're warmly invited to the Turnbull Center's annual Holting Conversation in Ethics uh, event. It's Friday, May 15th uh, at our home in the UO Portland's White Stag Block. You probably know where to find us. We're under that sign you may have heard uh, a bit about. Um, uh, Peter will be speaking uh, there along with a group of local uh, and uh, national journalists. It's a distinguished lot. Uh, the keynote will be presented by Brooke Gladstone, the uh, host of NPR's On the Media uh, Press Criticism Program. You can learn more at our website, turnbullcenter.uoregon.edu, or uh, come up and chat with me uh, after the program. It's free and open to uh, everyone, and hope to see some of you there, and thanks for listening. Our first question today, as always, will be from our Board of Governors host. <clears throat> our board host today is Sharon Van Sickle Robbins. Uh, Sharon has been a public relations professional for over 30 years. She's a past president of the PRSA Portland Metro chapter that I introduced earlier. Uh, she's a recipient of their Marsh Award for Lifetime Achievement in Public Relations. She's been a City Club member since 1996. She chaired the Business Environment Study Committee. It was approved by the membership just earlier this year. 
She is currently a member of the club's strategic planning committee and the club's development committee, and she serves as the club's secretary. Sharon? Thank you. Um, Peter, you mentioned briefly the Kindle and Kindle 2, and I guess uh, my question is about the role that you see those kinds of technologies playing. I, uh, and fairly new owner of a Kindle 2 and I get the New York Times every day on that for about the same price as I pay for my daily subscription for the Oregonian to be delivered. There are a number of other papers in the United States that are uh, available uh, daily on the Kindle but the Oregonian is not one of them and I was just wondering what the paper's thoughts are about that platform or similar platforms. Well I think it's um, it's an area that is ripe for opportunity is going to continue to evolve. I'm actually more excited about the technology that I read about that's coming, the flat screen technology. There's apparently a technology now that we're with a screen that is so flexible you can roll it up and stick it in your pocket and then unroll it and use it and it mimics the page turning experience. Um, wow, how cool is that? <laughs> you know, I, can't, I can't wait to have one of those. Um, and. Uh, as those evolve and become um, better potential substitutes for the print paper, I, I think we'll see more migration of it. I also think there's an audience um, that remains that is, candidly, over 40, that likes to hold a newspaper in their hand every day. Um, I, I contin consider my mother one of the um, most Articulate philosophers I know, and she says something to the effect of, eh, you can't take a laptop into the bathroom. And, um, um, and you know, or it's not quite the same experience on the beach or in the backyard on Sunday morning when it's 75 this weekend or whatever. So I think there's some of us, baby boomers and older, who treasure that on paper experience, but I do think um, Kindle is the baby steps of this technology evolving that's going to uh, become very exciting. And I was watching a, a, a woman across the aisle from me reading a book on her Kindle on a flight recently, and I said, wow, it's really good for that, really good for that, um, while I was sitting there reading a newspaper. Um, and, um, but we'll see. I mean, it's, it's sort of like every other question. We don't know yet, but, but it's coming. Uh, it's now time, a few minutes, for questions from the floor. Uh, asking questions at City Club Friday forums is a privilege of City Club membership. Today we're also going to invite um, any members of PRSA that would like to uh, ask questions. Please uh, keep your question to 30 seconds or the last. Remember, it, it uh, ends in a question mark. Thank you. This is Tom Cox. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, on the forum. The is the decline in newspapers like the decline in buggy whip manufacturing in the early 1900s that surely must have presaged a decline in transportation? Uh, only one of you really brought out the difference between form and function, ink on dead trees versus journalism. There's something called newstrust.com that none of you mentioned that provides crowdsourced editorial assessment of trustworthiness of both traditional and, uh, newspaper and bloggers. Now, The Economist newspaper is increasing its circulation. The Wall Street Journal is increasing its paid circulation. I would ask you to respond to this. As long as there is extremely strong government protection for free speech, and as long as there is a need that people are willing to pay for, there will always be journalism in some form. It's just that the forms are being disrupted. Can you respond? Well, I guess I would I would uh, would go back to uh, to to this notion of watchdog journalism and and perhaps what what uh, Peter was referring to as as newspaper journalism, even if it's not actually uh, ink on paper. That uh, that that what we're worried about here is that as the business models crumble and as the audience migrates to the internet, and then the internet audience is not worth as much. Uh, to advertisers and, and therefore the, 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 the business structures crumble, therefore that affects the, the quality of the journalistic uh, enterprise. I think we're less sort of concerned with what the platform uh, ultimately is than as long as, you know, as, as you noted the function, as long as there is a place for, uh, for continued watchdog journalism. Thank you. Steve Novick, City Club member, and I'd like to take this opportunity to ask Mr. Bhatia about a couple of business ideas I've wondered about. 
is your remaining audience of old fogies like me committed enough that you could get away with charging $3 a day for the paper? Alternatively, is, is it possible that you might have to think about going back to her style tabloid journalism and having more headless body in topless bar headlines on the front page? Have you considered either of those options? I have to say that since I think democracy is threatened, I would support either. <laughs> Why, why, yes, we're going tabloid Sunday. Stay here, stay tuned. Uh, thanks, Steve, great, great question. Um, the answer to the latter is no. Um, although certainly there are stories uh, from time to time that uh, edge in that direction, but not quite headless body and topless bar, the all-time great headline in history. Um, we've talked about, and and there's a lot of discussion in the industry about price points and about what you can charge for a newspaper. Um, readers tell us all the time, we'll pay more, charge us more, give us, give us more and charge us more. And that's something that we have to seriously look at as time goes by. You have to understand that for ever, I mean, ever for me is 55 years, but as long as I've been in journalism, um, the notion was that newspapers had something for everyone. That notion has to pass. We have to let go of that. We can't do that anymore. The, the internet has taken that away from us um, as well as a number of other factors. So as we become more focused in what we do and dedicate ourselves more specifically to a certain audience, arguably, to some degree, it is us old fogies, um, then perhaps that's one of the ways that we generate the revenue to support the journalism that Al was just talking about. So yeah, that's a, that's a possibility. Now, at the same time, I'd tell you that every time we raise the price, the phones ring off the hook. Doesn't, doesn't matter. I mean, that's, and we're, we live in a time where, I don't need to explain this to anybody, you all understand this, people will pay 150 bucks a month for their cell phones or 75 bucks a month for their uh, high-speed internet or whatever the case what it is. 15 bucks for the newspaper, that's the first thing they cut in tough times. It's just the nature of society right now. Ruth Radford, City Club member. Um, I have a question about the urban and rural divide and the proliferation of web-based media. I didn't hear anyone talk about the implications of how difficult it can be in rural communities to have internet access in the home. Um, I'd like to hear some comments one way or the other on that issue. Well, we've, we've talked a lot about this, um, this question of what's sometimes referred to as the digital divide, uh, which is the idea that there really are information haves and have nots in part because there's increasingly a heavy price tag to have you know high speed access and wireless packages and you know to be able to 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 pay for iPhones and and these these data packages that give you access to this to this wonderful world of uh, of information um, and so there's been there's there's been a a good bit of talk about uh, that some of the stimulus money goes for broadband development to increase uh, the proliferation of uh, of wireless broadband networks and especially into more of the rural areas because the commercial providers are going to look first to uh, you know to to set up uh, increased access where all the people are in in the urban areas so uh, there's been talk that some of the stimulus money might go toward uh, toward trying to sort of jumpstart uh, wireless broadband access and diffusion in more rural areas and sort of ease out that that urban rural split but there still will be the sort of the socioeconomic split as well with people who are unable to bear the costs of this information technology very good question Anne O'Neill, City Club member. Uh, about six or eight weeks ago, Sarkovsky, the head of France, uh, announced or proposed that government funding should be used so that all citizens would get a print newspaper. Now, do you think an idea like that would have much traction in the U.S.? Do you think that our uh, national and international leader in the White House should be uh, attracting everybody's attention to this problem? And how could we ever implement something like that in the U.S.? 
<laughs> My answer to that is Viva La France. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's highly unlikely. Um, one of the, uh, candidly, one of the, one of the uh, byproducts of a free press and the way uh, media works in this country is you will not find a, an elected politician who hasn't had a run-in with a reporter or an editorial board at some point. We're the last, you know, we're not GM. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, not, we're not the automakers. We're, we're not even the banks. Um, I, I don't see there being any, I mean, I love the idea, of course, and, uh, um, but uh, I, I don't see that happening. And you know, in a way, because of the First Amendment, because we have such fiercely held and, and uh, independence in media in general and in newspapers in particular in this country, it's almost a, a semi-offensive concept that we would do that in this country because we have to find our own way. They, they gave us this freedom. We're the only, as I'm, as I'm fond of saying, we're the only profit-making enterprise protected in the Constitution. So we have to, we have to find our way. There are, uh, one, of the, one of the jobs that I was also doing in Kyrgyzstan was we looked at transforming a state run channel into a public uh, media model. And there are lots of public media models that work around the world. And however, I think that they also work in societies that are quite a bit different than ours, where there is state control of some sort or another um, in a lot of different uh, industry. As we're talking about, will banks be nationalized or not nationalized? You know, those are the parts of the world that already have a history of that or where you have public models that are more comprehensive. Public media is not the same thing as state controlled media and public media can be a great and functioning system and we do have forms of it in America with uh, our public broadcasting system and there are opportunities for more support of public media in this country that could be a ways to have local coverage done in a different way. Um, it, it has not been in newspapers and I don't think it would be in newspapers but there are plenty of alternative public models out there that people can look at and explore and see how they're done internationally. We've run out of time and need to stop there. Uh, please join us next week for Bill Wyatt from the Port of Portland and his views on Oregon's economy now and into the future. Uh, none of you are allowed to leave unless you get that one person from your table to be a new City Club member. Uh, and as we close, please uh, join me in expressing our appreciation of today's panel, Professor Al Stavitsky, Peter Batia of the Oregonian City Club's Charity Fund. We are adjourned. Thank you.